Welcome to the US Chess YouTube channel and my brand new series, My Memorable Tournament Experiences. My name's Tom Shoup. I'm an expert level tournament player and award-winning coach from Alexandria, Virginia. Over the board play offers an unmatched immersive experience that you just can't get from online play. There's no better way to improve and form lasting friendships and unforgettable memories than by joining the U.S. Chess Federation and taking your game over the board. So I would like to start by sharing a game with you that I played at the venerable Marshall Chess Club in New York City when I was 29 years old. So I started my over the board play very late. I'm 40 now. Um, and my opponent who was playing the white pieces was just seven years old. So this is something that you have to contend with as an adult player, as an adult tournament player. You're going to play kids. They are really good and they are going to beat you. So you're just going to have to learn how to deal with that. But this particular game is unforgettable to me for another reason, which I will discuss in just a moment. So my opponent played pawn to b3. Now, this game was played in January of 2013, so this predates Twitch and Hikaru Nakamura's stream, so B3 was not a wildly popular system at the time. Of course, Fisher played it, uh, Bent Larson also employed it, but for me, I was just starting out with over-the-board play. My opening repertoire was relatively limited. I was on my own as of move one. So I did what I employ all of my students to do in the opening, and that is control the center, rapidly develop my pieces, and castle my king. So I played pawn to e5. My opponent played bishop b2. Now my e pawn's under attack. I don't want to defend it with d6 because I have aspirations of playing d5 in one move. So I developed a piece, knight c6, e3, and d5. Wow. Feeling great about my position, Already, I have full control over the center, and I'm standing really well. My opponent plays bishop b5, putting pressure on the pawn on e5, so I defend it by developing a piece with bishop d6. My opponent plays f4, putting more pressure on my center, and I reinforce with pawn to f6. Now, as I recall from the game, my intention after this move was to bring my king to safety on the queen side. Okay, I recognize that this pawn move f6 would be weakening if my king were to castle short. But if I were to castle long, I think this move is very logical because it reinforces my center. Now, <laughs> while I was completely immersed in the game and this struggle between a large center and active piece play, I noticed something really peculiar. And that is my seven-year-old opponent took out a toy train from his pocket and started playing with it on the banquette seat next to him. Now, these are seats where some of the most legendary players in chess history have played, including Capablanca, Alekhine, Fisher, and Carlson, just to name a few. I thought momentarily about raising my hand and alerting the tournament director, but you know what? It was a lighthearted moment. It was interesting to me. And I just kind of respected the fact that my opponent was a serious chess player, but also still enjoyed being a kid. So I let it go. But I think the main takeaway, besides <laughs> how humorous this is, is you're not guaranteed a distraction for your environment and over the board play. You know, you're, you're going to have to contend with distractions such as these in your game. So I viewed it as something that was not only funny, but also a good learning opportunity and a great way to kind of acclimate myself to over the board play. Because up until now, I had just been playing online in the quiet and comfort of my own apartment. This was completely different. So I am putting pressure on this pawn on F4. So my opponent reinforced with G3. I played bishop d7, breaking this pin. Again, my plan in this position is to play queen e7 and castle long. My opponent continues with development. I play queen e7. And after knight c3, 
I play queen e6. So my d5 pawn is under attack here. And this move nicely consolidates my center. And after queen e2, castles long, castles long, I was feeling really good about my position here. Okay, admittedly, I was still a little bit distracted by the toy train. Okay, I was thinking to myself, how is this kid only seven years old? How is he hanging with me? How does he have such a good position given his age and how distracted he is by playing with, playing with his car? But since I've looked up this player, you know, right before I recorded this video, and unsurprisingly, my opponent has gone on to become an expert level player. Um, so the other, the other takeaway is that Enjoy the experience because playing strong junior players not only can really improve your game, but who knows, you could end up being paired against the next Hikaru Nakamura, the next Fabiano Caruana. You never know. After h5, gaining space on the king side, knight h4, I played knight g7, completing my development, so my rooks are connected. And one thing I always tell my students, and that's why I made this little note here, is that when you cast along, it's always a good idea uh, to invest a tempo in playing either king b8 or king b1, depending on which color you have, because it just makes the king more secure. After rook hg1, here I really, as a coach, would have liked to see me play king b8. I just think this is a nice improving move. But I played a little bit more ambitiously. Um, I played pawn to g5 here, trying to challenge this knight. My opponent captured and here I think I showed a little bit of my ear inexperience okay because it's quite obvious to me now as an again peak rating 2025 um, I see these positions all the time in my students games I really want to play F takes e5 here okay take back with the pawn and maintain this beautiful center. I mean, look at how my mobilized pawns in the center of the board and on the king side just control so many key squares in my opponent's position. But instead, I took back with the bishop. Okay, I thought that this was the prudent decision to challenge this Fianchetto bishop and to try to activate this piece. But the thing is, you know, if I had taken back with the pawn, F takes e F takes e five. Once I bring this bishop, once I bring this rook to the open F file, this bishop's actually just kind of shooting into the void. It's actually not a very active piece. It looks good, but it actually doesn't do much. So that's just an interesting observation I had looking back at this eleven year old game. Knight f three. Bishop d6, I wanted to preserve the bishop, and I think that was the right decision, but of course, it cost me a tempo. Again, another reason I should have played f takes e5. e4, and here I remember going into the tank, and sure enough, my opponent was playing with his car right now. So this was probably the most kind of distracting moment <laughs> of the train play, because my opponent just took concrete action in the center of the board by playing e4. The position's opening up. It's becoming very tactical. It's definitely a good idea for me to slow down and try to figure out what's going on here. So my first move was good. G4. Okay, gaining some more space on the king side, challenging this knight. However, after bishop takes c6, this is where my position started going off the rails. <laughs> So, I will turn it over to you in this position. Black to move. There's a lot going on here. Okay, have to think. What is black's best continuation? Pause your videos. The best continuation, and congratulations if you found this, is the simple recapture, knight takes c6. And after knight h4, black can play d4, keeping the position relatively closed, gaining space in the center, and driving the knights towards the edge of the board. And I think black would stand really well here. 
it's roughly equal, but I think black definitely has a better side of equality. Instead, I miscalculated by playing g takes f3. I thought this was a good move because it was gaining time on the queen, but I missed this really nice move by my opponent. So I'll give you the opportunity to find it yourself. White to move in this position. What was the key tactical move that I missed? Pause your videos. Congratulations if you found the really nice in-between move. Intermezzo, Zwish and Zug, whatever you like to call it. Bishop takes d7, check. Oh, man. This, this move hit me like a freight train. It really did. Because I thought g takes f3 was a forcing move, and in fact, it wasn't. So after here, I'm forced to recapture with the queen. And after queen takes f3... Um, I'm down a pawn and my pawn structure has really become butchered. I played bishop e5 here, trying to activate my bishop. But again, this is incorrect play with the bishop. I think it would have been better here to push on with d4. I would still be worse, but I think this would offer black a better defense. Instead, I played bishop e5. And then we got into a very forced sequence. e takes d5, knight takes d5. Knight takes, bishop takes check, and we liquidate into a rook and pawn ending. Now, rook and pawn endings are typically drawish, but this one's an exception. This position for black is an absolute train wreck, okay? My opponent played d3, which was a good move. So why is this position so bad for black? Well, first of all, black's down a pawn. Second of all, these pawns on the king side, the pawn on f6, a pawn on h5, are critically weak. And white has also been first to claim this open e-file. Okay, so I have a very difficult, if not impossible, defense on my hands. Um, I realize that now. I don't think I appreciated how much trouble I was in um, during the game, but... Seeing this now, I absolutely cringe <laughs> looking at this position. King d7, so I did what you should do in the end game. Okay, queens were off the board. This is a rook and pawn ending. I need to use the king as an active attacking piece. So I begin to centralize my king, king d7. So pretty good end game play for me. You know, I had a provisional rating at this time. This was one of my first tournaments. So I'm happy at least that I understood this end game concept. <laughs> Rook f1, nice move by my opponent, putting pressure on this pawn on f6, which I defended by pushing it, and he took up a really nice blockading position with this rook. I mean, this rook is phenomenal. Okay, it's like I'm it's like my position is a locomotive and his is like a high-speed bullet train. <laughs> this this rook just controls every key square permanently fixes f5 and h5 as weaknesses. So all I could think of to of doing here was playing king d6, just continuing to centralize my king. My opponent plays d4. Okay, and here I didn't sense the danger in the position. I played rook g8 in this position. Now, my idea here my rather primitive idea as a provisional player was to try to play rook g4 and trade off this active rook on f4, okay? Of course, my opponent had other ideas. Unbeknownst to me, I had blundered in this position and white has a completely winning position. Okay, so I will turn it over to you to the last time. White to play, what move did my opponent put on the board that actually made my position collapse? Pause your videos. So in my haste to activate my king, I didn't appreciate the fact that my rook is now critically short on squares. So my opponent correctly played pawn to c4, great move, forcing my rook to a5. 
and then after c5 check king d5 and rook takes f5 i am completely busted okay i'm going down two more pawns my rook is completely off sides and in this position i decided to call it a day and resigned wow so a really memorable game of course not only because of this crazy story about my seven-year-old opponent playing with the train but it also served as a really good learning experience for me okay in the opening dealing with a line that i hadn't prepared for i was really happy with the way i was able to fight for the center and certainly equalize a position if not come out better i also really in enjoyed the learning experience that I had with playing against distractions, you know, it not only made for a great story, but it really helped me to understand the true nature of over the board play and what I needed to focus on in my training to improve. So that's why even, even since that tournament, okay, when I'm, when I'm preparing, when I'm studying, I try to study and prepare in environments that are not quiet. Okay, I'm a, I'm a dad now, and very often I like to solve my serious over-the-board puzzles while my daughter's watching cartoons. So that's something that I really employ, implore you to do in your own training. Prepare for these distracting environments because you are not guaranteed a quiet, free playing venue. And also, in terms of the play, I think this game really taught me the value of forcing moves and being able to calculate them. Okay. Just because you're attacking the queen, just because you're attacking a high value piece, doesn't mean your opponent has to move it. You need to look out for forcing moves in the position. And I just missed that spectacular shot. Bishop takes d7 from my opponent. I'll put that one on the board. Really good move by my opponent. Um, and congratulations to you if, you if you saw this. So I hope you enjoyed the video and this new series. I'll be back with another memorable tournament experience next. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.